Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've ever known a drug addict, you know how addiction works. You try a drug, and it lights up your dopamine receptors like it's the 4th of July, and you feel an incredible sense of euphoria. But then the drug wears off, and you come down, and you find that you were in even worse shape than you were before. You're feeling even more misery than you did before, which is what caused you to try the drug in the first place. So you go back to the drug, you have, and then you have, find that you have to take even more of it to get yourself back to that place of euphoria where you can no longer feel the misery. So you start off with a little, and then you need more and more and more and more. You can understand how it is that people on this path very often end up overdosing. And as it is with drugs, so it is with sin, something that the Pharisees, the chief priests, and the scribes reveal over the three years of Christ's earthly ministry. So Jesus arrives preaching the gospel. He comes proclaiming the good news that sinners can now have peace with God, that no one can earn salvation, but that God is giving salvation to all who repent as a free gift. So these people hate the notion that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are just as pleasing to God as they are. They despise Christ's suggestion that they have failed to make themselves holy through following the law. And so they grab this drug of pride and they consume a bit of it. They grumble under their breath about Jesus when he speaks the word of forgiveness. They quietly despise Christ and doing so fills them with a sense of self-righteous euphoria. But then the high wears off and Jesus grows only more popular and this makes them feel more miserable than before. And so they come to Jesus with clever questions, trying to trip him up to show that, the scripture, that they know the scriptures better than he does, and trying to get him in trouble with the secular authorities. But he outsmarts them time and time again, which makes them feel even more miserable, so they consume even more of the drug called pride. They become such raging addicts that it doesn't mean anything to them when Jesus performs miracle after miracle, proving that he is, in fact, the very Son of God. When he fulfills the Old Testament prophecies, when he raises people from the dead, their hearts simply cry out, give us more of this drug of pride. So now, after three years of tearing their hearts apart with this substance, the only way they can find the high that they want to find is by putting Jesus to death. So they plot, they scheme, they take handfuls of that drug and cram it into their veins when they hand Jesus over to Pilate, insisting that, they be put, that he be put to death. They consume more and more of this self-righteousness as they scream out for a murderer named Barabbas to release to them. They froth at the mouth and scream for Pilate to put Jesus on that cross. And once he's there, they take even more of that drug into their system, laughing and mocking at this man who tried to make them feel the misery that they are desperately trying not to feel. That is how you go from muttering under your breath to murdering the Son of God in three years, by getting addicted to this drug called pride. And yet the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, they are not the only ones to follow this trajectory. We are also experts at tearing ourselves apart in order to feel the euphoria of pride. So Christ comes to us in his word, proclaiming his gospel, telling us that all of our sins have been taken away and that he's made us worthy to be called the children of God. And so we reach for a taste of that pride. In a moment of weakness, we silently think to ourselves that our sins can't possibly be that bad if we don't, in fact, feel so bad about them. We may concede as some sort of historical event that Jesus died for us, but we silently question whether he actually needed to. We silently assume that we certainly could have made ourselves worthy of eternal life if we'd been given the opportunity. But then the word pushes back against us, telling us that we are, in fact, no better than the fools around us, that if it were not for Christ, we indeed could not and would not have earned salvation for ourselves. And so we hear this word and we feel the guilt that it brings. And so we dig both of our hands into, that, into the pride pills in order to drive away 
that nauseating guilt and feel the euphoria of self-righteousness again. So we criticize anyone who would preach that word to us. We leave our churches in order to humiliate our pastors and show them that they are fools for failing to see how holy and important we are. And yet that word still follows us to our new location, making us feel miserable again. And so we consume even more of the pride drug. We quit gathering to hear the word, telling ourselves that we never really believed it anyway. We lash out in anger at our friends or our parents who try to call us back, insisting that they are just weak-minded fools. We chase down sins like fornication and blasphemy to rub them in the face of God and all who belong to him. We tear our lives apart, frothing at the mouth to blaspheme our God, and we destroy our union with our Father. Because oftentimes in just the span of a few years, maybe only even a few months, we have become uncontrollable addicts of a drug called pride. So just like the chief priests and the scribes, because of our addiction, we rejoice to put the Son of God to death with our sins. But strangely, Christ rejoiced to receive that death because in that death, he won salvation for the chief priests, for the scribes, for the self-destructive sinners like you. Just as Christ couldn't be outsmarted by those who hated him, he couldn't be outmaneuvered by those who hated him. So when his enemies conspired to put him to death, Jesus used that death to defeat his enemies by making them his brothers. From the cross, Jesus reached out his hands of love and took away the sin of pride that tore his enemies apart, the pride that coursed through the veins of the chief priests and the Pharisees, and the pride that coursed through your veins as well. From the cross, Jesus took his pure, holy, innocent hands, the hands pierced with the nails of your making, and he took the drug out of your heart. With his blood, he washed away every vile word you ever spoke while chasing the high of pride. With his dying words, he undid every wicked deed you committed when you were so foolishly trying to numb your bad conscience with more disobedience. At the cross, Jesus took away your pride. And because he traded his righteousness for your sins, then you never need to consume the drug of pride again. You don't need to be afraid to admit that you are not holy because the blood of Christ has now made you holy. You don't need to tear yourself apart, propping up the illusion that you are worthy of eternal life because it's not an illusion anymore. When Christ shed his blood for you, when the one who you hated loved you with his dying breath, he made you worthy of eternal life. When Jesus Christ bled and died for you, he filled you with something that the drug of pride never could. He filled you with the love of God. And that is something that will never wear off, something that will never not be enough, something that will never disappoint you or leave you alone and forgotten. With his passion, his death, and his resurrection, Jesus gave you the right to wake up every morning and to gleefully and joyously turn away from pride, knowing that pride can never give you something better than the treasure you already have, the undying love of your Father in heaven. Amen.